Okay, I think uh, we'll make a start. We're on 73 people and it's still rising, but um, I would like to um, welcome Katie Birch today to give our annual adoption lecture. It's lovely to start the new year with an annual adoption lecture, which we've been doing um, for the past sort of six to seven years. Katie is an assistant director at the Institute of Public Care at Oxford Brookes University, and she's a leading researcher in support for young people and families affected by adoption. And today she's going to talk to us about recent innovations and ongoing challenges in adoption support. So we're really pleased to have you here, Katie. Thank you very much. If you have questions, if you put them in the chat, I'll keep an eye on the chat. And at the end of Katie's talk, then we can put, pose those questions to Katie and um, hopefully she'll be able to give you more information and clarification in those questions. So thank you very much, Katie, very appreciative and looking forward to hearing your lecture. Thank you, Alison. Um, and I'm really delighted and honored uh, to have been invited along to give this year's adoption themed lecture for Exchange Wales and Cascade. Um, as you may guess, I'm uh, addressing you today from uh, a slightly unusual location. I'm in my uh, garden shed in Bath. Uh, it's been my home office for the last two years almost, can't believe I'm saying that. Um, it's, it's a nice place, it's quite a nice place, I'm lucky. Um, uh, but I'm sure like many of you, I'm getting a bit tired of it now and um, I'm beginning to yearn for a bit of a different environment, a bit of a change of clothes maybe as well. Um, and with, without wanting to be too clunky uh, at the start of uh, this lecture, um, I suppose that's a bit of a theme um, for the innovations in adoption support um, that I want to talk about. So, you know, we're doing okay. We're, um, you know, some things, changes, improvements um, have gone, gone quite well. Um, some actually better than expected even, um, but inevitably, inexorably, perhaps um, we're looking forward to something different again, um, to better things uh, going into the future. So, on that note, and with in mind that, um, although 45 minutes sounds like quite a lot of time to speak for, I brought along quite a lot of material with me today. So I'm, without more of ado, I'm gonna get on with it. I'm looking forward to um, uh, chatting with you at the end. Um, so um, as Alison said, I'm an assistant director at the Institute of Public Care, where we're a research and development unit that's embedded within Oxford Brookes University. Um, and I've been working in and am unashamedly passionate about children's social care and support for children and families. I've uh, been working in this field for over 30 years, initially as a child care lawyer. So um, an interesting landing into academia. I suppose <clears throat> during that time as a child care lawyer, I basically worked out that I was um, rather less interested in courtroom struggles and rather more interested in what actually happened to uh, children and families, including what happens to children and families next after they come into care. Um, so turned researcher about 20 years ago, and I've been getting involved in a real range of small, medium, large scale studies, um, largely relating to children who are either at risk of coming into care or who have uh, come into care. Um, and some of whom, of course, um, will have been adopted. Um, uh, most recently, I've had the immense privilege of leading two national studies in this area. Um, one in Wales, an evaluation of the adoption support framework, um, uh, which was a, a large mixed method study, um, seeking mainly to, to get the views of adoptive um, uh, parents, but also sometimes young people, about their experience of post-adoption support. Um, and then secondly, um, I've been leading and continue to lead an evaluation of the Adoption Support Fund, same acronym, different phrase, in England. Um, that evaluation is being undertaken in, in considerable stages over three to four years. It's a longitudinal, obviously, study, 
um, including looking at the um, needs of and experiences of adoptive families across three points. Um, at a baseline point before they receive a whole you know, range of adoption uh, support that's funded through the Adoption Support Fund, at the point at which that funded support ends, and then six months later. Um, in terms of participation rates within those studies, um, we have um, uh, over 300 from the Wales study and over 1,000 from the England study. So in total, that's pushing 1,400 adoptive families who've participated in those studies. They're different. Obviously, one is exploring a very particular fund intended um, by way of targeted therapeutic support, and the other, the Wales study, is looking much more broadly at adoption support. However, we are finding some um, quite similar uh, uh, things that are emerging from those two studies. And um, before I go on any further, just absolutely have to say a big thank you to all adoptive parents who've participated in those studies. We know we are asking you a lot for your feedback, for your views, for your experiences. But these studies, I think, will you know, contribute significantly to the evidence base and in continuing to help services to meet your needs. Many thanks also to the National Adoption Service for Wales and for the department, to the Department for Education for funding these studies. Um, so um, what am I going to talk about? Well, uh, what I wanted to talk about um, is mainly, of course, about the innovations, but I wanted to spend a bit of time initially just looking at some of the current drivers for innovation in, ado in adoption support. There's quite a few of them, I think, um, and, you know, we all have different views about their significance, but certainly they all seem to be contributing um, in the current climate. Um, I also want to introduce a framework for thinking about adoption support, and I can't take any credit whatsoever for that framework. This is a piece of work that was led by the National Adoption Service for Wales, a collaborative piece of work with the sector to generate, uh, as I said, a framework, a way of thinking about different forms of adoption support. So I want to, I want to introduce that, and, and it will also be a framework, I hope, for talking about the innovations. And then I'll go on to explore um, uh, the recent innovations in universal support for all adoptive families, targeted support for when families have emerging additional needs and more specialist support, including for complex needs. And then finally, if I get a chance, why not? I've been given a platform. I'll, 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 I'll end with some concluding uh, re reflections um, that I suppose are quite personal based on some of the things that we've, we've been finding through those studies. Um, uh, so the lecture is going to draw, of course, on those two major national studies that, that, that I've mentioned already. Just to mention that one of them, the Adoption Support Fund evaluation in England, has also included a very specific standalone element, which is a review of um, adoption support services that were funded um, by the Department for Education in England only, uh, unfortunately, um, during the initial COVID period. And I think we've learned quite a lot um, from that period about innovations, more of which in a moment. But of course, I'm drawing on a much broader evidence base here. The, these studies aren't, of course, they're not, you know, just standalone breakthroughs. They, 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 they are drawing hugely on um, a, a wealth of studies that are either up already underway or have concluded, um, and I've listed some of them here. Of course, the adoption cohort study, the seminal study that's been undertaken by Cardiff University colleagues, um, following tracking, if you like, children um, with a recent adoption over time. Of course, the uh, Adoption UK barometer studies, which year on year tell us um, about um, families' experiences of adoption and how, the, how they change over time. Um, there's research being undertaken by Strathclyde and Glasgow University at the moment, really, really important and will push our knowledge base further. Um, and of course, I've drawn, um, we are all drawing on evidence reviews that have been undertaken um, in recent time. And I, I'm, I'm particularly thankful to those undertaken by the Tavistock unit and um, by uh, Professor Julie Selwyn 
in recent times. And then finally, um, I will touch on some of the evaluation form of regional adoption agencies in, in, in England. So quite a lot um, of different studies, not just those that I've um, been fortunate enough to lead um, recently. So goodness me, we've got this far into the lecture and I haven't even mentioned innovation. You know, what do we mean by innovation? What, what, am, what am I thinking of when I'm describing innovation? Well, of course, you know, innovation, it's fundamental to our beings, our being, um, and can incorporate anything from an idea, a little idea about how to improve things right through to much more radical um, change for better or worse. Um, I really like this image. And for those of you listening only um, through audio, you won't be able to see it, but it's a, a really nice sort of cupped hands um, uh, um, with, uh, with a light bulb, with a, 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 um, a, um, some plant growth within it, sort of bubbling out from it. I suppose I like it because it emphasizes a range of things, including that innovation is often born out of things that we already know or have come to understand, um, mostly, sometimes, but mostly not completely out of the blue. Um, uh, um, different things, different ways of doing things. Um, it also emphasizes that innovation needs to be nurtured. It needs looking after, it needs implementing well and time to develop um, from an early concept into something more robust that can be copied, replicated, if you like, elsewhere and, and where people can have um, uh, 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 confidence in, in what it can do. Um, and then finally, that it, it requires an element of energy to get that lift off and faith as well, um, you know, to give it a go sometimes. So um, I like all reasons why I like uh, that image as well as some of the more um, uh, uh, formal uh, definitions of innovation. Um, history of innovation in adoption support. Hmm. Um, I like this image too. <laughs> I mean, of course, there's a strong history um, of innovation in adoption support. A lot of people trying new things, continuing to learn and develop offers of support over many years. Um, I would say particularly since the Children Act of uh, 1989, which coincided with my entry into the professional world, so I remember it well. Um, but obviously, all of that innovation, that gradual um, improvement and change over time, was very much in the context um, of what's been known, hopefully not anymore, but um, known and, and even spoken about quite overtly as a Cinderella uh, service um, nestling um, mainly within children's social care, but more broadly within the offer of a support to children and families. Um, so on the one hand, a jewel in the crown, very much so and very much thought uh, of by by particularly social care colleagues in that light, but on the other hand, a little bit hidden away, uh, a little bit underfunded perhaps. Um, and I suppose from all of that I've seen over the last 30 years of my involvement with services, it's really in the last five to six years, I would say, that things have really started to accelerate in terms of change and improvement, things that are more visible, particularly to adoptive families. Um, so um, that is certainly something that I, you know, bear it very much in mind. And with that history in mind as well, um, thinking about why innovation is important, so important in adoption support. Goodness, I've, I've, brought, I've brought along two slides worth of, of these reasons. I'll try and just touch upon all of them. Although, I, to be honest, I felt I could go on for quite a lot longer. Um, so some of you will think this is you know, very, very succinct and summary. I suppose at the top of my list of reasons why innovation is so important is that it still feels as though there's a need to address some historical, I would say sometimes persistent myths that for adopted children, a warm, loving family is enough or should be enough. So we know from the research that yes, warmth of parenting is important for adopted children as well as for all children of course but it's widely recognized certainly within the sector now that 
all or almost all uh, adopted children and families will need some extra help at some point along their adopt adoption journey. It won't be the same point for, for all families. All families are different. So I think that there has been a shift within people working within this niche, if you like, sector um, about that, um, addressing that myth. Uh, within society more broadly, I'm not sure. I'm not so sure. So that takes a while, doesn't it, to ripple out um, for people to understand that. And with, with, um, with that, um, uh, you know, warm, loving family is not enough theme comes, of course, a whole bunch of reasons why that's not enough. Um, and the um, All Wales Adoption Cohort Study reminds us that a really significant proportion of children who are uh, go on to be adopted have experienced at least four adverse childhood experiences, essentially trauma before the adoption. A really fundamental finding um, there. And that's a conservative estimate. Um, secondly, um, we know and we have known for a very long time um, uh, that early life disrupted attachments for children can have a negative impact on the quality of their later relationships. That's through childhood, but also into adulthood. Um, so that's a, that's a second very important reason why uh, we need to challenge that myth. Um, finally, um, and this is a growing area, recent studies are suggesting that really quite a high proportion of adopted children um, have been exposed to drugs and alcohol um, uh, in utero, um, so prenatally. Um, um, and although those numbers are not yet trickling through to formal diagnosis, the broader studies really are beginning to suggest to us that that, that is likely to have been the case for quite a large proportion of children. Um, we know also, we're beginning to learn that some adopted children also have other neurodevelopmental conditions. So um, that might be autistic spectrum disorder um, or ADHD. Um, and our studies in Wales and England, those recent ones I mentioned first off, have um, identified diagnosis rates for children aged 11 plus in the region of 10 to 15% for each of those uh, uh, second set of diagnoses, so um, ASD and ADHD. The studies don't show that same high proportion for diagnoses of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. They, in the Wales study, it was quite low at 1% and, and in the, the England study, just a little bit higher than that. Um, so, and we know that those conditions can have quite a significant impact on child concentration levels, self-regulation and other things. Um, so those three um, factors are really key here to explaining um, some of the difficulties that adopted children may have either within the family home or at school. Um, we know also that where those factors overlap, um, it can at the very least make it quite difficult to understand what's the cause and effect. Um, uh, and um, that is increasingly becoming a challenge, I think, for practitioners working in this field. Um, we um, know from our two studies, um, the two key studies I've mentioned, that um, very clearly adopted children have significantly greater and more complex emotional health and wellbeing needs than children in the wider population. Um, that's on average, of course, across those cohorts, 1,400 odd that I mentioned. Um, these levels of emotional health and wellbeing needs are more akin to other care experienced children, including those in the looked after populations. That's very clear too. Um, many of many adopted children also, of course, have learning or educational support needs. In the two cohorts in England, the England and Wales cohorts, this was about a third of each of those populations with a formal plan. So that might be an individual development plan in Wales or an EHCP in England. So lots of reasons there why innovation is important. Um, here's a few more. We know, of course, that, um, as I mentioned earlier, issues, difficulties, don't they're not necessarily consistent across an adoption journey. They can arise quite suddenly 
um, in particular at transitions, maybe into a new school um, or, 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 or a, a tra transition for, for the family, maybe moving house or something, something similar. Um, that's when issues can either arise or they can heighten. Um, uh, and often that's happening, of course, after initial period of support for the adoption. Um, uh, so um, our NAS study, our Orwell study, uh, very clearly identified that honeymoon period from um, uh, adopters who had more recently uh, adopted, um, describing that things were going pretty well, actually. And of course, um, uh, parents of slightly older children either describing beginning to find things difficult or, 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 or coping with some quite uh, significant difficulties. Um, there's, of course, the issue of managing contact with birth families that's, that is often really significant here. And with the advances in technology and significantly during COVID, we're hearing from adoptive parents, this has become a bigger issue even than before. Um, uh, almost finally, we know uh, that, that caring for traumatized children can have really very traumatizing effects on, on parents themselves. Um, and uh, where parents are being severely challenged, that's going to have uh, 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 probably a negative impact on, on, on children themselves. Um, again, in both of the, the major studies that I mentioned at the start, we, um, we found significantly worse emotional health and well-being um, amongst adopted adoptive parents compared again with the overall population. So again, that's another reason why those studies are really quite significant because they're very clearly showing that significant difference. So many thanks to all of you parents who completed uh, the standardized measures for those that, that, that's looking at um, emotional health and well-being because um, that's, that's really enabled us to um, make that significant finding. Of course, COVID has also been experienced as really challenging for some adoptive families. Our studies have found about in about half of cases, um, maybe families found it a bit easier even during, particularly during the initial period of COVID, but at least half found it more challenging um, and particularly families where the child is preschool aged or, or, or older, so teenage, older teens. Um, they were more likely to find uh, uh, certainly the initial lockdown periods of COVID quite challenging. Um, I want to talk about drivers for innovation in adoption support. Oh, I, again, I thought I could go on, but these are the key ones really for me. Um, I want to mention ground up innovation. Of course, sometimes quite a lot actually. Innovation happens not with a particular funding stream or um, with a particular policy, but people getting together and saying, come on, surely we can do something better here than, than what we're doing now, surely we can innovate. And there's some examples there of innovations across the um, England and Wales, including uh, for, uh, in relation to fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, in CUNTAF, um, the TESSA programme across the UK, um, and so on. We, that clearly though, funding and significant um, uh, UK and devolved government funding has been really very significant here. We, without a doubt, we can see that um, those funding streams have contributed contributed at least to the acceleration of innovation. Um, and I haven't mentioned others here, so you know that might include national lottery and other funding streams that that, that do also play in here. Um, National policy, again, plays its part. We've had national policy across England and Wales that has significantly altered the landscape of adoption support structurally. So we've got a national adoption support service for Wales. We've got regionalisation across Wales and England. Um, policy is also affecting the focus for adoption support. So I've already mentioned the adoption support framework for Wales, but there's also new policy in England um, achieving excellence everywhere that's really driving um, some of the evidence-based findings um, and looking to generate greater consistency across adoption support. Um, I'm bound to say it, aren't I? Being a researcher, but research, um, and also um, commissioned evaluations and service reviews, they all play their part here um, in seeking to understand better um, what's going on and to share, crucially to share findings um, with people um, so that, that, that we're all learning 
as much as we can as we go along. And then clearly events like COVID, and I'm going to come to that um, shortly, have um, and can play a part. Really, ideally, I would have done this slide as a kind of really complicated Venn diagram with all of those interlocking and none um, more significant or more important than, than others. They are all important. And, you know, I guess just in, even in producing this material, maybe think, hmm, need to be more aware of all of those drivers, actually, pretty much all the time as we go along, um, thinking about how they come together and thinking what, what we can push harder on as we go along. So I mentioned the innovation, the first innovation um, uh, in adoption support um, earlier, and this is a framework for thinking about adoption support in Wales. It's been developed now for about four years, um, co-produced with practitioners and families, um, with the support of the National Adoption Service for Wales. Um, and as ever, some of the best innovations are wonderfully simple. So um, this is all on one slide. It's a framework for thinking about adoption support. And under the umbrella of support, we've got these three key areas. So universal support. I think sometimes universal support gets, gets a bit confusing. You can never use a phrase anymore nowadays, can you? It means different things to different people. But for, certainly for me, and I, I think for colleagues working in adoption support across Wales, this means support that's universally available to all adoptive families rather than to families um, more generally. So things like access to really good quality advice and information, support groups, family events, and so on. Um, and then um, under the umbrella, we also have targeted support. I think of this as being for emerging additional needs as families go along and as, as transitions are made. Um, but also for some more complex um, presentations. And then finally, more specialist support, um, including um, uh, looking at the interface with more generic specialist supports like uh, child and adolescent mental health services. I think actually the targeted and specialist support services, the more I look at it and the more I think about it, it's quite overlapping. So some um, support um, uh, for th that's useful, for families with emerging additional needs is actually also quite useful for families with more complex needs um, and, and vice versa. So they are quite overlapping. Um, I want to um, look at uh, um, some universal level support innovations. So, you know, we know quite a bit about more traditional supports um, that have been deployed, used, um, used by families for a long time really now to, to, to help them with their adoption, including, of course, good quality pre-adoption training, preparation, post-adoption social worker support, peer support, therapeutic life story work, and birth, con birth family contact support. There's some, there's some information there about some of the evidence base. I, I've kind of, unfortunately, added it in to some and not to all. I, I guess overall, the evidence base is quite good for these um, supports in terms of the extent to which they work. Um, uh, we need to learn more about how specifically they work, but certainly there is some evidence that they, um, they all work. Um, so what's new with universal support? There's an awful lot that's new um, that we found out about in Wales. We found out about universal supports a little bit less through the England study because it's much more focused on looking at targeted support. Um, so we know certainly in Wales that many more new adopters are being, particularly new adopters are being encouraged to and able to ask for help um, and getting a welcoming response when they do. Um, we, we're seeing that there are lots of agencies, adoption support agencies who are in much better and regular communication with adopters. So there's been, I mean, it may not even say, sound like an innovation, but it really is important that, 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 that they're kind of reaching out to adoptive families um, through a range of methods to remind people, not least about the availability of adoption support, but also give some clues and ideas about the sorts of things that could be useful. And um, we know that information is uh, really important because in the past, adoptive parents have said, you know, there wasn't enough transparency about the support that was on offer. They didn't know enough about that. So it is really important. It seems like a small thing, but it's important. We've got a clearer front door 
for post-adoption support. And that's in both England and Wales through these regional adoption agencies. That's a fundamental change. Um, and that is also seems to be really important because in the past, adoptive parents have said they've had to knock, knock on different doors for to find um, a pathway through to support. So a clearer front door is, is, is clearly really essential. Um, we're seeing some advice lines um, being set up for swifter response to queries when, when people do need help. Um, and we're seeing more accessible, I think, on um, peer support groups, including online, of course. I, I, I don't want to mention too much about this because we're all so aware of it. Um, during COVID in particular, these were accelerated, accelerated if they didn't already exist. And they seem to be, have been really helpful for so many um, uh, families. Um, I would uh, mention in particular for single parents, um, families living in rural areas um, and parents with older children who may not have had such great access to peer support in the past. So those, those groups that have been accelerated through COVID are really important. We have some great feedback about them. Um, there's a growth in buddy schemes. Um, uh, so that's a little bit different, of course, to peer group support. So this is one-to-one -one peer support. Um, and we're seeing that emerge either in its own right or part of a broader offer. Um, we've got more post-adoption training, um, particularly uh, looking at therapeutic parenting post-adoption. Um, we certainly have improvements in, in uh, therapeutic life story work. Um, uh, where in the past, um, certainly across the UK, adoptive parents had given you know, some quite poor feedback actually about the quality of materials and the nature of that as an intervention as opposed to just, just a, a life story book. Um, and then finally, we've got more emphasis on universal access to memberships and subscriptions. So that might be to Adoption UK, the National, uh, National Association for Therapeutic Parenting, and some of those memberships really burgeoned during COVID and um, perhaps where parents weren't already subscribed, you know, certainly some really, you know, found uh, an, an awful lot of support through those, through those memberships. Of course, there's a link between those memberships and the training and webinars and so on. Um, I would say though, that um, that's a huge amount of innovation that we've seen. But the parents in our um, uh, Wales um, uh, evaluation really did emphasize that they continue to value very strongly their social worker support, um, peer support, including more traditional forms and post-adoption training. So they, they, don't, they weren't wanting to see some of those more traditional supports go. They, they, those, if you like, are the foundations for some of these innovations. And I suppose COVID has emphasized the importance of having options and a menu of support. So for example, where a parent's working, they don't have only one opportunity to get peer support through a particular time of day or particular day of the week. They can access support in different ways. Um, where might the gaps be still? Well, certainly the, uh, both of the studies that I've had a significant involvement with in both England and Wales have emphasized that although things have improved and for some families, um, schools are really beginning to show that they understand and can respond to children's needs better, actually, there still seems to be quite a long way to go. So it's very patchy. Um, and given that this is consistently described school as a major area of difficulty, if not the main area of difficulty for children, um, I suppose that's of some concern. Um, you know, ideally we would want all schools and nurseries and uh, further education um, organisations to understand um, uh, the needs of adopted children as well as other children who may have experienced uh, trauma or who may be neurodiverse. Um, there's something I think also really fundamental about how to get the message out to being open to support for parents of older children. Um, certainly through the Wales study, we found that some of those parents, although they may have you know, received email uh, contact or, or other newsletter type um, information, actually it's been a long time for some of those um, parents, um, uh, a long gap really between the time when they had had support initially and now, 
And there's something just about how to get that message out really well um, that, that we're open to support and we've got the right kind of support for you where children are older. Um, so those are the those are the kind of areas really um, for further innovation that certainly appear um, very strongly. Um, I want to look at targeted support um, when for when needs arise. Um, I think this is has also been a, a really strong area of growth and, and, and unsurprisingly really because of the investment that's been made both by Welsh Government and the Department for Education in recent years. Um, so again, just touching base with the uh, some more traditional supports. I don't really like that phrase, traditional supports. They're not traditional. They're just supports that I suppose have been um, uh, provided um, more consistently for, for, for a longer period of time. Um, so social worker advice, still really very important and valued uh, as our parents, parenting training programmes, a whole range of those now available. Um, We've also seen the emergence, not particularly recently, but over time of um, some of these other therapies, particularly play and creative therapies. Um, uh, and those particularly for younger children, of course. Um, uh, DDP, dyadic developmental psychotherapy. Um, yes, um, uh, very popular. Um, uh, and we now have, of course, a large scale trial being conducted by Glasgow University led by Helen Minnis. Um, and we, we know that, that there's, you know, a lot of social workers are, are now trained to at least the basic level in DDP. Um, and, um, you know, it'd be really interesting to see through that large scale um, uh, study um, what we can learn about the impact um, of DDP. Certainly the feedback from parents, qualitative feedback, if you like, from parents is, is very consistently positive about how useful and helpful DDP is. Um, we've also seen the emergence of other therapies like sensory integration processing therapy to help children process and react to, sen to sensation um, more efficiently. Um, sometimes used on its own and sometimes as a precursor to other forms of therapy. Um, and, and we're learning more about the sequencing, of course, of different therapies and how they can be most effective. Um, and finally, some video feedback on parenting um, uh, that's, that's often supported by the Tavistock is, is, is also, has also been around for some time and is well used. So some of the more recent innovations um, that we're seeing are uh, just listed here on this slide. We're seeing um, a real growth in multidisciplinary teams, including multidisciplinary assessments, consultations for families, and sometimes that leading to very much uh, jointly produced, including with the families, plans. Um, uh, I think we urgently need to explore more about how and in what circumstances those arrangements work. But the um, some of the early findings, not only from our studies, but also there's an early paper by Rachel Draper and colleagues at Cardiff University that suggests that um, families experience these teams and arrangements very positively and they're learning um, really rather a lot about their child's needs and how to share those needs with schools and others. So um, uh, we, we, as I say, we need to we need to learn more. There's other there's other innovations and there's some overlap here in terms of the approaches. So um, there's of course the TESSA programme, which is being trialled across the UK, including in England and Wales. And that's very much again integrating clinician and, but here also peer support for families with early stage difficulties. So that's a clinician led assessment, uh, some coaching for families, school consultations, peer support through a parent partner, um, and a large scale study is being conducted by Strathclyde University They're about halfway through looking at the impact there. But again, some of the early findings that incidentally we're picking up through our broader look at adoption support across England and Wales. Um, we're seeing some really positive uh, early signs about the value of, of that programme. Um, we've got Adopting Together that's um, uh, supported by St David's in Wales, which is, again is a quite similar model, but perhaps even at an, at an even earlier stage attempting to get at that multidisciplinary assessment of need and, and, and planning 
proactive planning um, for children who have had to wait longer, longest um, for, for um, a forever home. Um, some of the things that have emerged through COVID are really fascinating. And our, um, our COVID review that was undertaken in England um, last year was looking at um, for services that often had had to be commissioned at incredibly short notice from providers, um, what, what was most valued? And actually this uh, brief interventions and psychology, psychologist uh, consultations came out top pretty much. Um, uh, uh, so that could be rapid response, um, including the assist, uh, assessment elements, sort of usually up to three further follow up calls, consultations, some coaching on therapeutic parenting, talking about the impact of the child's difficulties and trauma on uh, the parents. So a real range of things that can be covered through those brief interventions. And again, we need to know more about how they work and why. But, a, a, you know, a really nice new complement to what can sometimes seem like um, quite long therapy for children and families. We've got some innovations in peer support networks for adopted young people. They've been going for years, of course, for adoptive parents, but, but there's some really nice experimentation around how best to um, uh, support peer support for, for young people. Um, and then, of course, we've got a whole range of innovations relating to online, including actual one-to-one -one therapy, webinars, so on. Um, uh, so, um, Again, here, we know what might be the areas for further in, in, innovation. Clearly, although a lot of families are getting the right help at the right time, some have not. And so there's still uh, some learning here to do around how to avoid a, a weight, a significant weight for support. We know more broadly in relation to family support that waiting often is really unhelpful. There's, a, there's an issue around timing, which is, is really significant. Um, there's certainly something I, I think is on uh, the minds of colleagues working in adoption support um, currently, which is, you know, how can we um, really pull together some well tailored coordinated supports for older children, young people, particularly those in transition to adulthood. That feels like a bit of a, uh, an area where we could continue to push our, our knowledge base and, and to innovate. Um, there's something also that COVID has led, um, including through the COVID fund in England, which is a refocusing, I think, on parents as key agents um, of development and change, positive change for, for children, including in their well-being and recovery. And to do that, of course, they need to be sufficiently well informed and they need to have support in their own right. So there have been some interesting innovations, including around couple counselling, um, around well-being coaching, well-being retreats. We're seeing a real emergence of those. Um, and really that COVID review that we undertook last year emphasised or re-emphasised the significance of um, the, that focus on, on parents as key agents, um, which perhaps arguably just got a little bit lost through some of the, the, the um, child uh, directed therapies that have emerged that are, are of course also really very important um, and then there's something around financial allowance allowances and, and transparency around that how am I doing for time oh goodness I need to get on I'm almost finished I was just about to give you an alert that you're nearly there yes <gasps> I'm nearly there um uh well um it wouldn't be right if I didn't talk about specialist support but specialist support well I'm not a specialist um uh, I, I've looked at lots of different aspects of adoption support, and this is a complex area um, and one for, for colleagues with, you know, really um, uh, often a high degree of experience and, and expertise in, uh, in working with uh, complex needs. But what we're noticing through our studies is that um, there's a continuation of some of the uh, more traditional supports that have been around for a while, including, of course, DDP also used um, at the specialist end, as well as other forms of uh, um, family therapy and support to deal with violence in the homes, including through NVR. Um, so there's, there's, there's ongoing um, uh, emphasis on those, 
But what's new? Well, we're beginning to see, we don't know quite enough yet, but we're beginning to see through our studies that some of these newer therapies can also um, be, um, have, have a real impact, including EMDR, um, where uh, a child is essentially attending to their uh, emotionally disturbing um, material uh, in sessions while simultaneously um, focusing on external stimuli. And that's really all about helping children to process their trauma. Um, and as some of you may have um, picked up a bit like me, um, a very accessible, wonderful book by Bessel van der Kelp. De Kelp um, and he describes uh, how um, these memories often haven't been processed at all, or hardly at all. So it's less about reprocessing and more about actual processing of those um, memories. That's the body keeps the score, of course. Um, uh, there, there are other innovations here, including around CBT that's more trauma focused. Again, the multidisciplinary teams come in here and at this level, specialist level, um, those that are doing innovative work are, are really seeking to have much stronger links with and referral pathways into CAMS. Um, and last but not least, we are beginning to see signs of much greater innovation around assessment diagnosis and support pathways for children who may have neurodevelopmental difficulties. Um, so uh, the, 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 the two that I'm mentioning here are one in Wales, the CONTAF assessment diagnosis pathway for, for, for children with suspected fetal alcohol uh, um, uh, 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 spectrum disorder. And then there's also a, a, a support hub for children um, with or without a diagnosis uh, in relation to fetal alcohol spectrum disorder that's in Scotland. Sorry, that's my first mention of Scotland. Most of my focus, of course, has been on England and Wales, but I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't not mention the support hub there. Um, I think there's going to be lots more uh, innovation in this area. I hope so going forward. Um, and just finally, um, you know, uh, you know, where could we look to for further innovation in uh, this area of specialist support, including for children with more complex or overlapping uh, needs? And I think there's something around, of course, I've got to say, speedier, uh, more consistent access to assessment and diagnosis. Um, this has emerged from numerous studies, including our own, and parents, um, you know, really report waiting quite a long time or uh, even to get on some of those pathways. So there's something about that. Um, uh, there's something about consistently good interface between adoption specialist services and CAMS. Um, and um, obviously also there's something about the availability of support for families with complex presentations and, and a greater understanding. We need to learn more about what works in terms of support, whether it's a diagnosis or multiple diagnoses or or overlapping presentations. Um, so lots of progress in the last five years, I would say, um, accelerating more recently, including because of the COVID period. Um, uh, adoptive parents, you know, talk a lot about what they have um, welcomed and benefited from. Um, still, uh, unfortunately, some people feeling shame and um, uh, stigma about asking for help, we need to address that. And certainly from our recent studies, um, we're learning that some of the characteristics of effective support are not just in relation to the evidence base, but things like services, having that really good understanding of the needs of adopted children in particular, uh, and attributes, strong attributes of compassion um, and um, uh, being non-judgmental, which are really, really important. Um, I haven't got time for my final reflections, but they will be in the slides um, <laughs> that hopefully are going to be made available to um, everyone at the, um, at the end of our session. I hope, I, obviously it's a bit of a trot there through a number of different innovations. I'm, a, I'm very conscious it's very broad um, uh, what I've been describing, but hopefully if you have an interest in some aspects, you can drill down through the links that I've provided in, this, in this, the material to, to look in more depth. 
Okay, well, thank you very, very much, um, Katie. That was absolutely fascinating. And, uh, you know, you managed to cover an awful lot. So thank you very, very much. We've got lots of questions coming up in the chat, which we'll, um, I'll put to you. So the first one is from Philippa Williams. Hello, Philippa, nice to hear from you. Um, and she asks, has the comparison be, has a comparison been done between the FASD diagnosis rates in Scotland compared to England and Wales? Um, she notes that Scotland has had a greater focus on FASD for several years, and thankfully Wales and England are now investing more time, money, et cetera, in this field. So really, it hasn't been anything done on comparisons? Well, that's a really excellent question. And of course, this area is so difficult because... Um, diagnosis rates can be affected by so many different things, including the availability, of course, of a pathway to, to, to diagnosis. Um, it does seem as though uh, in Scotland quite a lot of work has been done um, to look at this. I, I think from talking with colleagues in Scotland, they would say they have, they, even they haven't got it completely right yet, um, but um, it's possible, um, and I haven't seen the rates for Scotland, but it's possible that those rates um, would be higher. I would expect so if there's better access to uh, assessment and diagnosis pathways. Um, even through our two studies, we can't, we're sort of comparing apples and pears, unfortunately, because um, the rates of diagnosis um, that, as I described, was just at 1% in the Wales cohort, that was a, a broader cohort of adoptive families. Whereas in the England study, there we were focusing on children who had recognised additional needs. And so you'd expect that rate to be higher. So it's a, bit, it's a little bit difficult, but um, I don't know. And perhaps someone can tell me. I'd love it if someone could tell me. Um, uh, but it would be great to, to, to be able to compare a bit, bit more of those rates across the UK. Hopefully, you know, hopefully improvements can be made right across the UK going forward. And, and we can have a better understanding, actually, not only of how many children are affected, but how and, and what that means in terms of the support that, that they need. Oh, I can't, I think you're on mute there. Yeah. Oh, mute, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Um, yeah, so we have another question from Maya Campanar, whose in fact um, doctoral dissertation was on adoption support. Um, what, so hello, Maya. What are the assessment pathways for any of the support services and how well publicised are these pathways? So, um, hi, Maya. That's another really great question. And um, uh, I'm, I, 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 in terms of pathways, I've been talking about pathways in relation to assessment for, um, uh, 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 for some children, including children who may have uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder or an autistic spectrum disorder. So there's that, those kinds of pathways. And then there's assessment pathways for all or, or, or some other um, adopted children. Um, and uh, certainly currently the assessment pathways um, uh, for the, at the specialist end are, tend to be more generic actually. So they're specialists, but at the same time generic. So not just focus on adopted children, of course, but all children um, uh, and mainly uh, supported by and directed by health services. Whereas the pathways for support services for, that are universal or more targeted in nature are, are um, supported by um, uh, much more by adoption support services embedded within social care organizations, mostly at a regional level. Um, I think huge improvements have been made in assessment pathways, but also the content of assessments. And I think the big shift in recent time has been um, in the application of multidisciplinary assessment. So it's gone from being, oh, a real exception in very specialist cases to being gradually now accepted as more of a norm actually for, for children who um, are adopted and, and, and at an earlier stage, because one of the things I was gonna say on my final reflections is, can we get better at identifying those children who are likely or more likely to require quite a lot of support over time rather than waiting for <clears throat> problems to arise. So I see that journey in relation to um, assessment pathways having improved really significantly. We need to get the consistency there too, um, but there are that there is a greater acceptance of the need for, 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 for that holistic uh, assessment of a child's needs. Okay, uh, thank you, Katie. We've just got an observation from Fiona Jones that's saying during COVID lockdown, 
um, pe people who have worked in care homes have found that children were a lot calmer because they weren't seeing social workers or attending planning reviews or having contact with family members. So just an observation, not really asking you anything. So I will yeah. yeah, it's so varied, wasn't it? For different for different children in different circumstances, it could be much better for some, and 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 sadly quite a lot worse for some. It it, it was really difficult to make it. Yeah. Yeah. So Suzanne um, Griffiths um, from NAS has asked the next question, Katie, which is many of the innovations NAS has been rolling out have been based on the premise that early intervention and preventative support services will reduce the need, including need escalating um, that's required at a later time. Is there evidence that this basis continues to be right, notwithstanding, of course, that we accept the need to work on some other things for example, more established families and services for adolescents with current higher level needs. I would say this. Thanks. Thanks, Suzanne. Thanks for, you know, a really challenging question there. Um, I think that the evidence base around the impact of earlier intervention and prevention is still very much in its infancy. I think we need to do more. I, 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 I'm going to say that I'm a researcher, but I do think we need to do more because there is that hypothesis that it will reduce need from escalating um, later. We, we, we know a bit more about that in relation to general family support for all families who might need it. Um, there's certainly some evidence that that's the case and certainly some evidence then when you remove earlier intervention and prevention that you see um, a need for more specialist services escalate somewhat. It's very difficult to attribute that to one thing in particular because Context changes over time, drivers change over time, over whole cohorts, you know, for whole co cohorts of children. I think we need to learn better, I get scrolling back to what I was saying about the innovations, the significant number of innovations in universal and early targeted support. Um, uh, we need to learn more about how, how useful they are, not only just in the short term, but in the longer, the medium to longer term. And some of the studies that I've mentioned that are being conducted by colleagues are really looking to do that. Um, and then I think we'll be a lot more confident about their value. But in the meantime, I think we've got to hold firm. We've got to hold strong. Um, and, uh, um, you know, these, um, you know, 99% of these interventions are strongly evidence-based. They're based on a really good understanding of child needs and child development and they have been tailored to the needs of adopted children specifically. I think we need to have confidence that, you know, an expectation that they're going to make a difference, but at the same time, we need to measure it, no matter how difficult it is to do that. But there's just an observation from Colin Turner. Hello, Colin. And um, I'm currently looking at the provision of pre and post placement support to children and carers living together under a special garden, guardianship order arrangements. And practically all of the need identified for adoptive families are the same as SGO placement, mm -hmm. which is yeah. interesting. I don't know if you've got any comments. But oh, I do. That's a whole nother lecture, Alison. <laughs> <laughs> and Colin, I'm so glad you raised that because, of course, our study in England is looking at support for not only adopted children, but children with a special guardianship order. And we're very aware of the overlapping needs of those cohorts of children. But they also have some different needs. And in fact, some of the needs that we're identifying relate to the whole family. So um, special guardians have some different needs to adoptive um, parents, and we need to tailor support accordingly. Um, in our forthcoming publications that relate to the Adoption Support Fund, we'll be getting into a lot more of that. And we hope, hope that that series, the final series of publications will be published shortly. Um, uh, but also the, our review of the COVID fund, which was also for adopted children and children with special guardianship order, touches on a lot of the needs of um, uh, children and families where there's a special guardianship order um, in, in, and, and the innovations in, in, during COVID and, and how applicable they were and how useful they were for, um, for those families. Um, so if you'd like to get in touch, I'd be really happy to while away an hour or two talking with you about, about social guardianship support and also share some materials because today the focus has been very much on uh, adopted children. But in my reflections, as you'll see um, on the slides that I haven't shared, one of them is around, we've learned so much about 
what works for adopted children and families over the last patch of time. It's been, a, as I said, an accelerated learning period. And a big thing, that not only I'm wondering, but I know other colleagues are wondering is, what can we learn from that and apply and tailor to support for other children who are care experienced in children, including children with special guardianship, but also perhaps children in foster care. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of learning, um, a lot of read across, um, uh, as well as, of course, some need for tailoring. Um, so that's a big question mark for me um, a bit, and a big challenge, of course, going forward. Um, so, yeah, there's a, a question here from Claire Mears, um, Katie. Do you agree that the increased use of social media has created a need to innovate adoption support services? Um, I, I, I do. I, I think there are various strands to that. Um, so one of the strands is around, of course, contact with birth families um, and how increased use of social media has, of course, you know, made it easier for everyone to get in contact. Um, and that brings, um, you know, some advantages, but also some significant challenges, I think, for adopted children and adoptive families, um, because it takes it out of that sphere of, of well-controlled, well-supported and managed contact into something else. And we know from our studies in the last year or so that adoptive families are saying, we need help. We need help with this. We need, I need to have some help to sit down and talk with my, my, my son, my daughter um, to anticipate this so that we don't get caught out um, further down the track. And I think certainly those messages have been taken on board by regional agencies and national agencies um, because it's been a clear you know, finding from the studies. So there's that sort of side of it, but also increasing use of social media has enabled adopters to, and uh, uh, adopted young people to talk with each other <laughs> more readily. And it's not for everyone, but some people have found that a real comfort and a real support, and it's enabled them to find out more about what's happening, what's going on, what's available. I think it also provides, it's also challenging for agencies because we've always thought that yes, um, you know, we need to, you know, have a framework for support, um, but that needs to be tailored regionally. And now I think through social media, uh, adoptive uh, parents certainly are, are beginning to look wider than their region and say, oh, look, you know, that's over here, what, you know. Um, so it's a challenge. <laughs> and that again is in my reflections. Um, you know, how can we balance that desire for consistency of offer? Well, really across England and England way across the UK, to be honest with the need for it to be tailored you know we don't you know people living in an urban area don't you know have the same access or the same needs necessarily as people living in a rural area but it can we get enough consistency that so that adoptive families can be confident about the availability of different forms of support i hope that well that's a sort of ramble isn't it in response. <laughs> no, I, I think you, you did answer it. Um, <laughs> I, you know, and someone's commented here, you know, it's completely different really to 10 years ago, that kind oh. of, uh, you know, yeah, it's totally. a different world, isn't it? Totally. So I've just got a couple of more questions come in, um, Katie. So um, we know that the need for adoption support doesn't end at 18, and yet most of the formal support offered by adoption services does end then. Um, mm -hmm. Do we know anything um, from research about the needs of adopted adults? And that's to Anne Bell. So he hello, Anne, and uh, nice to hear. Yeah, well, again, we don't know enough about the needs of adopted adults. We know some, uh, we know some things, um, you know, for example, in relation to disrupted attachments, that the impact, the ripple effect um, of disrupted attachments during early life can continue through into relationships, not only during childhood, but adulthood. Similarly, the challenges of trauma that's not processed, we know that that can very much have an impact on young adults and older adults' ability to function in the world. Um, and, um, you know, transitions are difficult. Um, and as Anne, I'm sure, will be aware in our evaluation of the adoption support framework, um, uh, looking at adoption support in Wales, we found many, we identified many innovations and many improvements in, in recent times, but one area that we pulled out 
um, for focus was transition to adulthood. Um, it's a journey, it's not an event. <laughs> um, and a lot of young people will continue to need support, um, uh, you know, quite far into their adulthood. I suppose a bit like other care experienced young people. I mean, you could draw that analogy. Um, you know, if we're saying that adopted children have similar needs to looked after children more broadly, then okay, looked after children more broadly um, have statutory supports through into their early adulthood. Now, not all adopted young people will want or need that at, all the time, but um, one would hope over time that 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 supports could be developed for uh, these young people. I think I think that's a really key area of innovation. And if I'm honest, I'm not aware of of that much that's happening at the time at, at the moment. But I suspect that organisations like Adoption UK and the regional agencies and others will be thinking about this and, and, and looking to improve really the advice and support that's available to families at that stage of an adoption journey. Okay, thank you, Katie. Um, I've got a couple more questions here. One from Michael, Will, um, Michael Wilson. Do you have a sense from adoptive families what they think adoption support from social workers in particular should be? Recent years in England have seen adoption support social work resource become focused on servicing adoption support fund application processes. So being rather process driven, I guess, and uh, around that particular funding. Mm. Yes, I mean, first thing I would say is that irrespective of what activities they're undertaking, the feedback we're consistently getting from adoptive parents is that they really value their adoption, post-adoption social worker. So that is a fundamental thing. Um, it is true that we have evidenced, um, you know, adoption, post-adoption social workers in England describing how they're spending, they have been spending more of their time, sometimes most of their time, on assessments. Um, but I think at the same time, we've also seen a growth in um, training for and um, more information for post-adoption social workers um, and encouragement uh, for those workers to skill up as much as possible. Um, so I hope, I think we're getting to a tipping point whereby there's an expectation that social workers undertake a range of things, including some assessment, yes, of course, but also some direct work with families. We know that it's very much valued, you know, perhaps not at the specialist end, but um, certainly we know that, um, and I'm gonna focus on Wales now, for, for instance, that across Wales and the regional adoption uh, services, increasingly uh, post-adoption social workers are doing things like um, uh, work with families around therapeutic parenting, doing, um, you know, actually doing some play therapy with children and sometimes with parents as well. Um, uh, they are often um, uh, trained up, um, not only in therapeutic parenting, but DDP to a certain level. So the skill base has really, you know, the bar has been raised, I think, quite significantly um, in recent times. And, and, and um, so I suppose it's frustrating for workers who are um, mostly servicing assessments, although of course they're using all that experience and ev evidence base when they're undertaking those assessments. And we think those assessments have certainly also improved um, in recent times. So um, complicated, it's a complicated picture. Um, I think most social workers would say they don't want only to be doing assessments, they want to be doing some direct with family, work with families. Um, uh, and so it'd be great to get that balance. Ooh. Hello, Katie. Hello. You're sorry, I just got thrown out for a moment there for some reason. Um, but we did have just a couple of questions uh, left, which I think we'll just make it the last two now, um, Katie. Um, so, uh, uh, this is, first one is really interesting one from Annabelle Lloyd saying that we'd like to start to catch the views of children young and young people on what they think of their life journey books um, later in life sort of you know when they look back on them and will research questions consider this going forward 
sorry, I missed the last bit there. So, yeah. so really, I think it's what what young people think when they look back later on life on those on those life story books. And will any research questions consider this um, in the future, or have you got any thoughts about including? Now, that? I have an omission to make here. This is not a big area of specialism for me. OK, so my my response is based on, uh, you know, this sort of these overview studies that we've undertaken. Um, I haven't seen an awful lot of evidence and I'd be really interested to see in the chat if others do know about this but, um, of um, children, and young people's views about um, uh, the value of not only the work that they may have done as a family or individually with a with a social worker to explore their life story. Um, but also the, the, the physical object. Now, I know that there is broader research being undertaken about the value of objects for children, particularly children um, who have come through uh, the care system, which I think is really interesting. So that's, that's broader than, than, than a, a life journey book or life journey materials. Um, but I think there is much to learn about this, both um, the value for children uh, during their childhood, but also in adulthood. Um, intuitively, of course, of, of course, there's, there, there, there has got to be the potential for um, uh, quite a lot of value, just as there is for all children who like to reference photographs, um, other objects that um, mean something to them um, or meant something to them as they, they've, they've gone through their childhood. So um, certainly I still keep one or two things um, from my childhood. I think there's a lot more to learn. And as I said, there's, there's been this broad, there's this broader study looking at the value of objects uh, more generically, but um, I don't personally know about the, the studies looking at the value of life journey materials into, into adulthood. Would love to hear about it if anyone's got that, that information. Well, that's really interesting about the objects, isn't it? Um, yeah. yeah well, fascinating. Yeah. I can yeah. post that on the, on the, the, the end of the, the slides. If people are interested, I could do a link to, the, um, to that, that, that body of evidence. Yeah, that would, that would be great. Um, so we've got um, a question here from Claire um, Hudson, Katie. Adoption disruptions peak in puberty and teenage years. And that is also the age at which it's often extremely difficult to get adopted um, young people to engage with traditional services. So yeah. it's a sort of uh, mix of both. The most difficulties arise and the least likely to be involved in services. Mm. Don't we need more innovation in creating opportunities to engage with adopted young people outside of social work and school? AU case uh, connected is a great example but maybe we also need a more tailored one to one relationships for teens with uh, in particular accessible in all parts of wales yeah um i mean essentially the answer is yes in a nutshell we do i think as i said we need to do you know there's there's a real i think there's a real space and place for more innovation in relation to finding ways of in, not just engaging with young people but but tailoring supports to whole families um, with teenaged um, young people. Um, I think we need to listen to what young people are saying about what sorts of supports they would find helpful. Um, I think there's much more to learn from them. And I am aware, I'm aware that um, there, there are, um, you know, projects afoot uh, nationally to, to do that, that I hope will come to fruition. Um, because as as um, uh, as you've said, um, uh, Claire, the difficulty is, you know, we may have a whole range of oh, here's our menu, but you know, actually, a, a teenager may not want to engage, particularly in talking therapy, um, at, 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 at that time. Um, I, I suppose the way in which I'm seeing services approach that is in part going through the parent. Remember, I mentioned earlier that seeing seeing parents as key agents. Well, that's one approach. Um, certainly during COVID, we learned that some young people didn't really mind having a web in, uh, uh, a Zoom call with a therapist. I actually prefer that to a face-to-face -face when they've got to come out of school or they've got to, 
you know, they don't want people knowing that they're going to a particular place. So it's, it's more discreet, arguably. It's, it's, it's more suited to their preferences for some young people, not for all. Absolutely. It's very difficult to generalise. But I, I just say, I think we need to learn more um, uh, because you're right. You know, that's the time when disruptions um, can be more prevalent. And, um, you know, it's a transition. <laughs> including the beginning of a long transition into adulthood. And, um, you know, we all need support uh, during those times. Um, and, you know, it can be really life changing. And so, you know, why shouldn't we learn more about how to make those supports more accessible and also um, more effective? OK, thank, thank you, Katie. Um, Sean is just reminding me that, she, in fact, she's standing in for Annabelle Lloyd. So the question wasn't from Annabelle. It was actually from Sean Morgan Richards. Um, and Suzanne Griffiths has um, just responded really to the penultimate question, the um, last but one question, saying that when NAS developed its life journey framework, we consulted with Welsh children and young people about that and what they would like to see in the materials we provide. This was some years ago and at some stage through Connected, we um, could repeat that in Wales. So yeah. another, another way of looking at that, I guess. Yeah. Mm, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that those materials have been really well received and that they are they are beginning to make a, a real difference to that work um, so we can see that cycle of improvement already already happening but would be great wouldn't it to learn more about how that can how that can how that work can be used as as young people grow yeah. into adulthood absolutely absolutely i've still got quite a few questions here how are you doing katie how are oh, you I'll, I'll, I'll hang on for a bit <laughs> okay lovely oh, well. so i think i've got another three here so i think we'll we'll put those and then we'll draw it to a close so um this is from helen hawksworth um she says that we know that contact and keeping in touch, especially with siblings, is hugely important. And when not done in a meaningful way, can have a destabilizing influence. Mm -hmm. Do we need to think about and look at more innovative ways that separated siblings can have this meaningful contact, possibly similar to STAR project in Scotland? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, 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 and the lecture, because again, because it's been so broad, hasn't really gone into any depth about how best to support um, meaningful contact um, for, for adopted children. Um, I think, yes, honestly, yes, absolutely. And, and I think, get, you know, in particular with reference to what we've touched on already, which is some of the challenges um, that have emerged uh, during COVID. So we know that um, quite a lot of children found it incredibly challenging not being able to see members of, of birth family, particularly siblings, during that time. So it was a reminder, if you like, of how important um, those contacts are. I think it, it's... <sighs> contacts... Again, I would say it would be really great to learn from more from uh, the children and young people themselves about their experiences of contact to really learn about, you know, the things that are, you know, that they, they really like and the things that um, get in the way. Um, but yes, innovations and yes, star. Um, yes, please. <laughs> Great. OK. And um, Bell has just got a comment here that AUK Cymru has just got some funding this week, which will allow us to develop a new service for 13 to 30 year old adopted people. And we will in, be engaging strongly with young people to design the new service. So lots of positive feedback. Oh, about. wonderful. That's great news. How fantastic. Yeah. Yep, I think, yeah, and um, I, I think that does bring us to the end of the questions, Katie. So um, I think I'm just checking, yep. Um, I, think, I think that brings us nicely really to a very positive conclusion to hear that there is some funding to progress that working with 
older adopted young people. Um, and just to say thank you very, very much, Katie. Really appreciate your contribution. And it's great that you have embedded all the links into your PowerPoint so people can access the research directly. That's a really helpful way for doing it. Lots of people have asked whether they can have copies of the PowerPoints and the recording, which we will make available as soon as it's put onto our YouTube channel. So thank you very much. Lots of people saying thank you, um, Katie, via the messages and how interesting they found it. And thank you very much.